All right, black holes. Yeah, so do you want to have a chat about how supermassive black holes grow? Yes. Which is what I've been up to, basically, is figuring that out. So... Uh, let me tell you what I think happens. Okay, go ahead. Don't they just sit in the middle of galaxies mm -hmm. and just, just nibble up anything that comes too close? That can happen. They do just sort of get gas funneled to them in the galaxy. The thing is, there are very massive, supermassive black holes in the universe. And also we see them at incredible distances, so i.e. very early on in the universe. And there is a limit to how fast black holes can grow just by what we say accreting material. It's sort of like how when you pull the, the plug hole out of a sink, all the water doesn't immediately go down, right? There is some pressure that stops all of the water just forcing itself down, like a bottleneck, right? You have a bottleneck around a black hole essentially as well. But it'll all get there eventually. It'll all get there eventually, yeah. But there's a certain limit to how fast that can happen. So for example, we see supermassive black holes as early on as 800 million years into the universe's lifetime. Unfortunately, it's not enough time to build a black hole in that way. In the early universe, you see a black hole that's, say, a billion times the mass of the sun, right? If you think it's had 800 million years to grow that big, the rate that it will be limited to, that's physically not enough time for it to grow that big. And then you've also got things in the universe today, things like Messier 87's black hole that's, you know, tens of billions of times the mass of the sun. It's huge, right? And so people think, well, how did it get that big? Now, the one correlation that we see is that the mass of that black hole is correlated with how big the galaxy is. So it's like the two have grown up together, essentially, right? So if you add more mass to the galaxy, you add more mass to the black hole. But there's also a link between the size of the black hole and the middle part of a galaxy. So if you picture of a galaxy, it's got that sort of disc shape, and then it's got this central bulge. And it's even more tightly correlated with the mass of that central bulge. Now, where those bulges come from is from mergers. So two galaxies merge together and you redistribute all the angular momentum and the energy in that galaxy that kept all those stars on nice sort of circular orbits that we see. You can take it so those stars are basically sank towards the center and instead of on, you know, nice ordered orbits, they're on sort of like chaotic orbits like a beehive. But you can imagine that in a merger, when stuff obviously then does sink to the center in this redistribution of energy, then that material will also feed the black hole and you'll also get the two black holes merging together. Are you saying the reason supermassive black holes can grow bigger than they should is because of mergers and they gobble up a whole other black hole? Yeah. Because I would have thought with the bathtub, with the water going down, yeah. if I suddenly came along with another bathtub full of water and just poured it on top, poured mm -hmm. it in, it still wouldn't be able to get down that hole any quicker. You're not dumping the other black hole onto what we call the accretion disk, which is sort of the bathtub of water that's trying to spiral in you've almost merged the two plug holes. So you've made the plug hole bigger. So not only have you grown the black hole in that way, you've then almost made it easier for it to accrete more material, right? Because you've made it so that it has a bigger gravitational pull and it can take more in. So this is why people think those are so tightly correlated is because you get the merger and you get extra growth from it. And then you see that in the fact that the bigger that bulge gets, the bigger your black hole gets as well. So much that by the time you get to galaxies that are all bulge, you know, these elliptical galaxies that are perfect spheroids that have had all of that nice rotation destroyed in lots and lots of mergers over their lifetime, they tend to have the biggest black holes. And so for a long time, people were like, that's how black holes grow. They grow in mergers, look at this correlation, Anything that doesn't have a bulge or has a very small bulge has piddly black holes, right? Because, that, because it hasn't had any mergers. Exactly, and because all it was able to grow with was your way you said at the start, which was just sort of the happily taking in whatever was around it. And the work that we did, first of all, in my thesis, and I've followed up in the past couple of years as well, was we took the galaxies that don't have a bulge. And we said, let's look at what mass those black holes actually are. Now, you might have thought, well, that would have been a really obvious thing to do, <laughs> but they're very, very rare, these galaxies. We first of all had to wait until there was a huge catalogue of all the shapes of galaxies out there that we could use, which came with a classification site called Galaxy Zoo, which hopefully some of your viewers will recognise. It was the website that got people to classify the shapes. It's still going, still needs help if people are up for it. And with that sort of database, you know, we had a million galaxies we could start with to look at, we ended up with a hundred of them of these things that didn't have bulges. So that just shows how rare they are. There are also things with growing black holes as well. So the way you get at the mass and you actually measure the mass of the black hole is you measure how fast the material that's spiraling around it is going, which means it has to be actively growing for us to be able to spot them. 
So when that happens, the, that material starts to glow. And this is what we call like a quasar when it's like glowing very, very brightly, right? It sometimes glows in the X-ray, but also it can glow in the optical. And so when that happens, you also get emission from hydrogen gas. And so you've got the sort of radiation coming from this material that then impacts the atoms in hydrogen. It excites the electrons. So if you remember chemistry from GCSEs, you have your electrons in your orbits. They jump up one, and then when they drop back down, they emit a very specific color or wavelength of light. And so if you were to take a spectrum of that gas that's orbiting around that galaxy, where you split the light, you would hopefully see this giant peak at that hydrogen color or wavelength. What you see, though, is instead of it being a very specific wavelength, it's sort of smeared out. And that's because half of the gas is coming towards you, so it's blue shifted and half of it's moving away from you, so it's red shifted. So if you can imagine how far that gas has been sort of smeared out, you can measure how big the black hole is because if you know how fast the thing is moving, you know how big the thing it's moving around. Which blew my mind as a PhD student being like, oh look, from this line that does this, I can tell you how big this supermassive black hole is. This seems like a lot of room for error in this process, but... Yeah, <laughs> but it's still possible. So we looked at these things and we found that they obviously didn't lie on this correlation of black hole mass and bulge mass. So this is the line where this is everything nicely sits, and here's the most massive things, the most massive bulges, and the most massive black holes. All our bulgeless things were over here. So these are galaxies that haven't had mergers, that have somehow grown their black hole just as big without merging with any other black holes. Well, how to do it? Oh, well, exactly. So this is what we're now trying to figure out, right? Is that, yeah, okay, we go back to this idea of, okay, black holes can accrete material that's around them, but it's limited to how fast it can do that, fine. But how does it, first of all, get there? So the galaxies we're looking at with these bulges things, they're very pure sort of spiral galaxies. They've been left alone their entire lives, right? So a lot of them have beautiful spiral arms. They're, some of them have these bar structures in as well. And so the leading hypothesis is that they funnel gas in and they funnel stuff to the center. Now, all the work that's been done looking at the limit of the black hole is obviously done in other galaxies and not in this. So there are some ideas that that could be different possibly, and that could be affected by the properties of the black hole. The paper I had last year was trying to work out what rate that material is being flowed in at, basically, and whether that will affect things slightly. So we looked at a, a smaller number of these galaxies, looked at about 10 of them. I somehow managed to call them after Harry Potter characters in the paper. I got that past the referee and I was very, very <laughs> pleased with myself. It was all about what color I'd highlighted them on the page, like to observe that night. It was like the red ones had to be observed on Tuesday night. So they were all named after Gryffindors. The green ones on Wednesday night, so it was Slytherins. When we looked at these galaxies, what we found was that um, their accretion rates of the black hole, the amount of material these black holes were taking in were five times higher than in a a sample of galaxies that had undergone these mergers. But the crucial thing was, is that unlike a bathtub where all the water goes down the plug hole, can you imagine if you took out the plug hole and the pressure around it built up so much from that bottleneck that it threw water back at you? <laughs> this is what black holes do, right? I like to say that they burp. Essentially, they're trying to take in so much at once that the easiest thing to do as that pressure builds up and builds up is to throw some material back out. Now, it doesn't come from the black hole, and that's what confuses a lot of people. It happens before the material you know, reaches that event horizon, that point of no return. What we found is that in galaxies that have had these huge mergers, you reach that pressure point sooner. And so actually you have these, the, burp point. the burp point, exactly. So these galaxies that have had mergers are actually burping up five times more than our galaxies that haven't. So our galaxies that haven't are still burping a little bit. <laughs> They're just not doing a giant mega burp. They're actually taking in more material than the ones that have had mergers. So the ones that have had mergers are just throwing most of it back out again. So it's almost like if you've had a merger, the black hole's a bit more full and doesn't yeah. want to eat as much. Exactly, yeah, it's already merged with another one. It's like, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. And the galaxy's like, but it is worth thin. And then you end up with this huge burp. But the thing is, what also happens is that um, the, the faster a black hole itself spins, the more efficient it is at accretion and that it can push up that limit. So, and this is very, this was a very important thing that we concluded in this paper was that if you think about how the black hole is actually getting this material, in a galaxy that hasn't had a merger, that's been left alone, that has its nice, pure disk, it's all coming in from the same angle. And so it's always gonna spin up and spin up and spin up the black hole. Whereas in a merger of two galaxies that funnels stuff towards the center and sinks up to the center, that's gonna be coming from all different directions. And so, wasp, wasp. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry. Could you be more English? <laughs>
<laughs> don't like wasps. <laughs> Bees, yes, wasps, no. Ah. But in a merger where you've had two galaxies merged together and all that material is coming from all sorts of different directions, then that black hole is going to be getting some material from this direction, which will spin it up this way, but then some material from this direction, which will spin it back the opposite way. And so what we found was that the sort of average thing that was probably happening is that in merger galaxies, the black hole is being spun down, as we call it. It's being averaged back to zero, whereas in our bulgeous galaxies, it's being spun up all the time. And its accretion is getting more efficient. And that's what allows them to grow so big because it's sort of like the sort of slow and steady tortoise rather than sort of the greedy hare in a way. I didn't know material from outside a black hole could spin up the black hole that way. I thought yep. once it crossed the event horizon, like all information is lost. No, it and... inherits the angular momentum of the material that falls in, which is quite cool. These results that we had were done with what's called narrowband imaging. So instead of taking a spectrum of light where you get sort of the emission from one specific element, instead what you do is you say, okay, given the redshift of that galaxy, I know this element's emission will be around about this wavelength. And so I'm only gonna let in light from that specific wavelength and take an image in that narrow strip. And then from that, you can sort of then work out well how much energy is in that because all of these burps, they tend to be very energetic and they will, um, excite these electrons but in oxygen in the galaxy right so if we can just observe oxygen then we can just get at you know what's going on in that burp but again what you need is this data where instead of just taking one spectrum either from the very center of the galaxy you can split it into a jigsaw and take lots and lots and lots of them so you not only can find out where this sort of burp emission is and therefore work out how much there is of it you can also figure out what impact it's having on the galaxy around it as well because that kind of throwing back out of energy back into the galaxy can then have a huge effect on the galaxy itself, right? It can heat gas up that you need to make stars. It can expel gas from a galaxy. So there's huge repercussions. So it's really important to understand how this tiny little process can have this huge impact everywhere else. And what's interesting to me is that like, okay, yes, mergers were almost like the low hanging fruit that was easy to spot that was like, this is clearly what's happening. But it seems as if this sort of funneling of gas is happening in every galaxy all the time, but then you only see the after effects of the merger because it's so apparent, right? And that was like the key thing that happened that you noticed first. We had some simulation friends as well that simulated this happening, and they showed that 65% of all the stuff, all the matter that's currently found in supermassive black holes in the universe got there because of this funneling process in galaxies, not because of mergers. So we've sort of flipped the hypothesis on its head that black holes grow by mergers and we're like, actually, looks like the majority of the time they're doing what you said at the beginning, right? Just happily taking in whatever's given to them. So we are in the black hole laboratory. What you're looking at, that's an analog rotating black hole. There are about 2,000 liters of water in there. If you follow me, here we have uh, two valves which we can open. It was really thin. The picture of Her Majesty the Queen was just a vague shadow 